timely, as in what the fuck's going on right now, and timeless, meaning tools for better living for good homegrown humans, which is where we take our deepest long-term stand. So for just a little bit of framing from our point of view, this is, this is, was anticipatable. This fits within the maps and models that we've been tracking for a couple of decades. It's a little early, a little acute. We wish we'd had a bit more time. Um, but what we're all experiencing collectively right now is, is there, there are definitely pins on the map for this and things like this. So we're going to try and strike the balance between timely and time, timeless. Um, I totally understand that everybody probably has a strong bias this week in particular to the timely. Uh, and we will address those things at the same time that we will also try and give tools, not just for uh, an emergent event like this, um, but for what this event uh, might be suggesting or teeing up about new normals and the future, et cetera. Cool. So I hope that helps for everybody. And we are going to, I'm going to go share my screen. This is going to slowly rainbow wheel our way into that. And for those of you that have been with us, that have been in our more in-depth trainings and programs, you've probably seen us share this quote from Bucky Fuller before, say in the last 12 months. Um, but this is kind of the jam. Uh, you know, our task is how do we get as many humans through the lumpy bumpy times as possible? And that is not just logistical, you know, at least in Fuller's terms, it's also metaphysical. It's a question of what are we doing as people? What are we doing as a, as humanity and how can we do this in culture? So initial and obvious disclaimers, don't take any of this uh, to the bank, to the hospital, uh, to the church um, uh, or to court. Um, so we are not engaging medical, legal, financial, or pastoral, meaning kind of spiritual or, or interpersonal advice. Um, this is really critical for everybody to be making your own informed decisions. So that said, um, why on earth would you bother listening to us? So just as background, this is not CV time. This is just so you understand where our pattern recognition and where our lived experience comes from. And then you can assess whether or not it's helpful. But 20 years guiding people in hazardous, wild, unpredictable environments, um, which creates a very strong set of pattern recognition. Uh, the other half was academic career, deeply into the guns, germs, and steel, sapiens, uh, as well as like bury my heart at wounded knee category. I, I was a romantic in college. I was like, where did humanity and civilization go off the track? And I went into graduate school all the way through um, all my PhD coursework studying anthropology in crisis and collapse and clash of civilizations. So thousands of case studies over thousands of years of so decline and fall, decline and fall. And how do we do this thing? So a deep, deep set of cuts because of the first two, we also got, we went way long on natural building, permaculture, sustainable community and off the grid living, AKA everything people are suddenly starting to think about right now. So we kind of went really, really deep in our twenties, had our kids, went a little bit more into mainstream world. Um, but in general, like we were already living this life in a deep way. Um, then I've spent a ton of time working in elite leadership training, managed a number of companies through the 08 crash uh, in a formal professional management consultancy firm. And then for reasons that probably stemmed from being connected in and writing about, you know, being part of these communities is what prompted me to be able to see the pattern and write about stealing fire. The writing of Stealing Fire just deepened a lot of these connections. And we have found ourselves um, in some very interesting nodes. And for instance, the next phone call I will be on will be interacting with folks from, you know, retired, but folks from SOCOM, folks with, who are, have been directly writing health briefings and economic briefings to the White House this week. Um, folks at Harvard, folks at Stanford, you know, epidemiologists, et cetera, et cetera. So, no personal credit for this one. We just happen to live at the intersection of a shit pile of very high frequency networks um, and happy to try and distill that while still honoring the discretion and, and kind of impact of where, the, where that information is coming from. So in, to sum up, right, this is Jim Bredwell. He was the founder of Yosemite Search and Rescue. He was one of the iconic uh, rock climbers of the 70s. And he had this funny ass quote that then became a bumper sticker for the Seattle Mountaineers, which is like, you know, your worst nightmare is my vacation. 
So the idea is like, it's cool. We've got this. Um, and, uh, and just know that, um, we can handle much more than we have been as deconditioned consumer zoo animals lately. Okay. So that's our preamble. If you're still here, you're still here. Let's jump in. Uh, the first is situational assessment. Then want to share kind of a chunk of frames for better sense making and decision making. Because it doesn't matter if we give you a punch list of things to do that's obsolete by Monday morning. Um, what we'd like to do, we, we do have that. That's that's the last one. We'll get to what to do this weekend, what to, you know, what to buy, you know, what to do, who to hang out with, whatever. Um, we will get to the tactical practical. But the tactical and practical has a sell-by date on it just by the nature of moving conditions. And what we really want to instill with folks is what is some good ways to make better sense regardless of what's coming down the pike. Okay. So that said, we do seem to be, um, and, and we have been for some time, by the way, not, none of this is particular to this week. This week just happens to be a more intense, wilder and woolier expression that has you know, hit everybody upside the head with a wet fish. But the reality is, is this has been building and taking shape for a long time. Uh, and we are increasingly at the intersection of the coming alive arc, which is what does it mean for us to be living our best lives, you know, versus the staying alive arc, which is holy shit, do we actually have the time and the luxury and the resources to pursue that indefinite inquiry into my best life? And for anybody that has found themselves kind of whipsawing between these things, and that's as much as like, what are our vacation plans? Or what do I really want to do when I grow up? Or what's an entrepreneurial idea? Or what is the intersection between <clears throat> my last spiritual breakthrough or insight? And what the fuck's happening on the ground? Like just to acknowledge that we are massively at a place of intersecting timelines. And as more and more folks are waking up around the world, and I'm going to give everybody the benefit or presumption that you are in some way not, you know, have not been operating in baseline socially defined normalcy, or you wouldn't be in our feeds. Um, that intersection is weird and a little crazy making. So if that's been something like your experience lately, no, you're not alone and no, this is happening at a structural level. Okay. So that said, um, I think we can actually do this. I don't, Lucas, if we have a poll teed up, please do it. If not, we'll just do it as a chat chime in. Um, but the real, one of the first questions, and by the way, most of this is coming from content that I've already, I'm writing in the sequel to Stealing Fire, which is called somewhat presciently, <laughs> Recapture the Rapture, uh, Rethinking God, Sex, and Death. For, uh, for a world that's lost its mind. So it just so happens that like, it's actually happening faster than I'm getting to write. So that's one of those things. Um, but this has been thought out. This is actually in the first third of the book, which is one of the ways for us to wrap our heads around stuff is to base it on historical precedent, right? So the first thing is, what do we think is coming in the next 10 years? Is it, is what do we think coming in the next 10 years more or less similar to what's happened in the last, last 10, right? Or is it more or less similar to what's happened in the last century? It's basically powers of 10. <laughs> you can see where this is going. Or the millennium, right? Or the epoch. And just to ground this in examples, right? If I'm willing to make a bet, I mean, I might say, I think next year is going to be just like last year. Cool. Then you are, you're at the power of one. <laughs> you're probably a minority at this point, but hold to it. Right. And by the way, we don't have a dog in the fight as to what conclusions you end up coming to. The only perspective we will put a stake in the ground to for is to say, we believe that a more considered position is better than a less considered position. Whatever you consider, and then whatever you decide, 100% your sovereign choice. So we're here to help everybody come to their own best considered position. Okay. So once in a decade, let's, and, and we'll stretch it in a few years so the math works, but basically you're saying, okay, um, the 08 crash, we survived that. Iraq and Afghanistan, right? Syrian refugee crisis, and let's just backdate it to include 9-11 you know, domestic terrorism and like that. You're like, wow, that's quite a lot that happened in that chunk of time, actually. And we survived all of it. If we think, yeah, that's, that's good, but I think this is churnier and weirder than that, right? Then we might include, go back to once in a century, right? And then you're like, okay, both world wars, Hiroshima, the entering of the nuclear age, Auschwitz, 
Spanish influenza, which was a deep cut when I wrote it two months ago and is now all over the news, right? But like these kinds of things. And we're like, okay, wow, that's even heavier stuff. But once again, we prevailed. We survived that. Once in a millennium, all the wars of European colonialism and expansion, the Black Death, you know, takes us all the way back to the Middle Ages. Pretty gnarly times, right? That's already getting into like Game of Thrones kind of territory. You're like, ooh, life was cheap, right? And some, some rough stuff happened. But once again, we prevailed. And then for all the marbles, potentially the kind of full bore epoch, you know, or, or is this the Anthropocene? You know, are, are we actually talking about the end of an era, which may include humanity? And that's where, you know, the, the different more doomy, super doom and gloomers uh, have been hanging out. Okay. So my question, oh, so let's see, different people are having different issues with audio. Uh, John, I just saw you said you can't hear. Everybody else is saying all good. Okay. Um, yeah, and somebody just asked, uh, and I don't know, Lucas, whether you're back on an audible, um, but if you are. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So I just got a heads up as we speak that LA's highways are now closed. So we're now actually going from airline quarantines actually into road travel. Um, so that's a huge thing. Um, so, so there we have it. <laughs> um, so the question here is just, what do we think is happening? And obviously asking this question, as we have for the last 18 months, often provoked resistance or bridling or kind of almost anger that, you know, someone was bursting our contemporary bubble. I, th I would say this week, we're pretty softened up <laughs> and willing to wrap our heads around these things. Okay. The next thing is just to ask, okay, um, Let's just say if we can rewind our time machine, if we can get into Dr. Henry's Wayback Machine to like two weeks ago, what was your sense of the future coming? And this is based on uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett's model of interoception, which is like, how do, how do we, her, her general idea is that like, we don't have a bunch of complex emotions. We just have gut feelings, like literally guts, like what's happening in our organs, what's happening in our vestibular system, our vagal nerve, like what are we doing at a basic animal level? And her thesis is that we're only ever in one of four places, active or passive. So I either have activation energy or retreat or going inwards, and it's either positive or negative. That's it. And then from there, we assign emotions and plot and all these other things. So you can kind of actually map most responses to kind of existential challenge, crisis, what's happening in the world based on that. So the question here is, where are you? Are you active, positive? Are you active, passive or internal? Are you negative, positive, negative? I mean, sorry, negative, passive, negative, active. And if you think about placeholders or organizations or folks in the news that kind of live in each of these quadrants, it, can, it might help you to understand. So if you're not familiar with deep adaptation, lucky you, uh, they're generally a well-meaning total buzzkill, but this comes out of Jem Bendel's work on existential risk. If you've seen the Vice Magazine article, it was like the, you know, the, the academic paper that's putting people into therapy. Um, Jem basically said, hey, I can't do corporate sustainability response court CSR coach advise me anymore. We're fucked. I run the numbers. We're actually definitely, definitely doubly, triply fucked. There's no unfucking this. And so our only solution is to actually wrap our heads around it. And so there is an entire global community that is basically in deep transformational grief practice, basically, um, including, you know, like just prioritize our lives. It's basically like we've all had an extended cancer diagnosis and the time is to make right uh, with our world and that, and, 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 yeah, and basically that now, if on the other hand, so that's internal, like we're not going to go out and try and change things. The changing time is done. And what matters, the only thing left for them is to say, let's get right with our relationship to the inevitable externals. If we stay in the interior domains, we might come across on the positive, but passive side or internal side folks in the new age, um, self-help space. And I'm sure you have lots of friends in your fees that are typing like now's the time to boost our immune systems with sunlight and chakra balancing and, you know, herbal remedies and, and those kinds of things. Um, and more, more broadly, um, not specific to this particular epidemiological issue saying, Hey, we need to transform our relationship 
to higher consciousness and we will bring in some new age right and the idea that negative thoughts create negative external realities and so therefore go to the heart of it and change your own you know change your internal development or relationship to love fear etc okay if we want to keep going the folks that are, have come to a negative conclusion but aren't willing to just contemplate it and shift their relationship to are rallying in the streets and that's the we've come to the negative conclusion but we're active about it we want to try and address it and then finally the folks that are active positive which is you know there's a lot of different expressions but arguably the techno utopians we can invent and solve our way out of this are some of the most prominent right so you can kind of see now the curiosity is just which which of these um most resonates with you so how about this let's let's see if we can can we uh actually um just put what your time frame is 10 100 1000 1 million and then name the organization that lives in the box you you most strongly identify with and, and with full permission we understand that this is a fluid thing and it depends on what the news feed looks like when we wake up every day but just go ahead and punch into the comments what time frame you're on and which quadrant you're in. Okay. Mike's there with singularity you in a hundred years. Awesome. So we've got, we got a hundred years, meaning real challenge coming potentially uh, as well as tons of invention and innovation. 100 active negative guy a hundred years, 10 years, 10 years SU. Okay. Awesome. Well, there's a lot of optimists. There's a lot of active optimists here, which is fantastic to see. Uh, 10 years extinction rebellion. <laughs> okay. And some, some others. Okay. This is, this is great. A hundred million, 1 million deep adaptation. Okay. So that's someone in the kind of uh, potentially full bore uh, X risk space. Um, okay. Awesome. 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 So um, this is the situational assessment. Uh, this is one that I shared this time last year, more or less kind of late spring last year. Uh, and this was based on the distillation of a ton of, uh, a ton of different sectors and research, but just want to kind of share it in some. We're not going to unpack it, uh, and we can post the link to this talk um, if it's helpful for you and or your stakeholders, people you care about, to kind of help them wrap their heads around intensity, severity, et cetera. But I think the first thing is just fairly uncontroversially, um, there is a pig in the proverbial python um, of backed up cause effects. And even if the hypothetical, we change everything today, which lots and lots of people have been desperately pleading for, for at least the last 10 years, even if we suddenly woke up, came to our senses and did it all tomorrow, there is a hangover effect of latent energy in the system that is going to move through it. And that is true both for current viral conditions, particularly in the developed West, and as of you know, literally right now, um, it is also true of the bigger issues uh, that we've all been mapping and monitoring. Part two is to say that magical thinking of any stripe, any kind of hockey stick exit, right, isn't going to be adequate to the task. And I would just say that you know, physics trumps metaphysics every fucking time. So um, what is really interesting, now this is the, we're into deep geekery for three minutes. So if you'll humor me, what is really important to understand is that we in the West come out of a highly, in, a deep structure of the Judeo-Christian eschaton, which basically means the alpha and the omega. Until the Judeo-Christian collapsing of time into time's arrow, that there was a beginning and there will be an end, most other societies, most other religious traditions were cyclical. And what this has done, and, and utopian ideologies tend to follow a familiar script, which is that our current conditions reflect some fall or some imperfection, corruption, or perversion. And whether that's getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden or whether that's the proletariat being hijacked by the capitalists, right? There's a situation. There is an inflection point coming after which humanity will be delivered into a perpetual steady state of grace. Right. And whether that's a communist utopia, whether that's a blockchain revolution, whether that's a psychedelic renaissance, whether that's the neoliberal Arab spring will topple the dictators and democracy and McDonald's will just arise. 
right? We repeat this again and again and again. And it's a well-known trope in sociology and history that communism is effectively just another Judeo-Christian religion stripped of a sky god, but with all the markers, right? And the same thing we could say is beware of hockey stick utopian escape hatches because the harder it becomes for us to solve what's right in front of us right now of how do we get to steady state how do we get to safety and security and belonging for all of us the more tempting it is to get engage magical thinking and it's cloud seeding and it's flying taxis and it's we're going to upload ourselves to the singularity like you name it. It, it there's silicon chip versions and there's jihadi versions but the structure is the same and the structure is fundamentally problematic for the all of us or none of us commitment, because it's almost always a rare elect that are good enough, true enough, bright enough, smart enough, rich enough, holy enough. You name the, uh, you, you pick the filter, but there's lots of them, but it's almost always a subset for the chosen few. And the question here is like, have we maybe got this backwards or we're just so zoomed in on it that what we see looks like a linear, you know, a hockey stick curve on an X, Y, two by two. And in reality, we're actually experiencing something bigger and more cyclical. So the question is, is how can we, right, not get seduced by sociopathic utopian solutions right now? And how can we ride this part of the cycle, potentially, right, without clinging or lunging to an idealized fixed point coming soon for those we, you know, those we care about? So I just want to note that we're just jumping into this. We have 60 minutes. I'm working on an assumption that most folks here already have some familiarity with our work, where we stand, how we see things, um, what we're committed to, which is a bunch of people waking up, growing up, and showing up for the good of humanity, but also taking on the kind of Stockdale paradox from uh, Jim Stockdale, the, the Navy Admiral, who was the highest ranking POW in Vietnam. And for, you know, famously, he noticed um, that the pessimists in the POW camps in North, in North Vietnam died. The pessimists died. No one's too surprised about that. But what was interesting is that the optimists also died because they would hang their hope on, well, the boys will be home for Christmas, the boys will be home for Easter, the boys will be home for summertime. And when those milestones came and went, they had nothing more durable or resilient underneath that hope to support them. And they literally just collapsed and lost their will. So the Stockdale paradox became something very straightforward, which is be ruthlessly realistic about short-term realities while remaining you know, relentlessly optimistic about long-term possibility. So we are 100% in that category. I don't think we have the slide, but also I'll share it with you anyway, which is Wendell Berry, uh, the MacArthur genius, poet, environmentalist, uh, has a beautiful poem. And in it, he has a line where he says, you know, he, he expresses the Stockdale paradox really well. He says, be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. So that's what we're doing. We're not pessimistic doom and gloomers. We're not in the passive negative bucket at all but we are absolutely encouraging decisive, ruthless consideration of current realities as we would in the backcountry or any other place. So here are some things that typically throttle or prevent people from actually wrapping their heads around this. The first is just how complex, how many browser windows can I hold open simultaneously without freaking out, getting overwhelmed, shit or go blind, and I just give up trying to make sense. So literally what is my cognitive complexity and my ability to sort competing conflicting information sets and still distill them into something right hopefully you know a gathering like this one might help with that the next is sacred cows what are the things that i consider sacrosanct inviolable and unchangeable until they're suddenly surprisingly not and do i for instance do i believe in america do i believe in nation states do i believe in capitalism do i believe in democracy right do i believe in Christianity and there's a plan coming with revelations. Do I believe, do I believe, do I believe? And they can be practical, they can be sociological, political, ideological, whatever. Sacred cows could be, well, fuck, I was dutifully say, said sucking things aside in my 401k and I was planning on retiring in one and a half years, 
right? What are our sacred cows? And then which of them are we willing to either liberate, <laughs> you know, open the barn door and let them go or shoot? Because they're no longer helpful and they're getting in the way of my actually seeing what's in front of me. And the next thing on top of that is very much our ability to metabolize or digest our grief. And I was just on the phone with our daughter. She's swimming on the Stanford swim team. They just won the Pac-12s. They're heading to the NCAAs to defend for the fourth time in a row their national championship onto Olympic trials where most of the team is going to be competing. And she and that whole team last night are having to digest their grief that the entire, all the seniors, I mean, they've basically all just been robbed of you know a once every four year cycle that they've been busting their ass for right, for the last nine months together. And that's just a one tiny example of like, holy shit, can we actually let go and honor all of the things that might not be yet or ever as a result of changing landscapes. So, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men. And the final one here, and we've got the link to this book, uh, which is Deep Survival, Who Lives, Who Dies and Why? in emergent conditions is that there's a lot of learned helplessness. There is the trap of habit. There is the tendency to minimize, deny, and deflect, and basically act later than we should. So questions of who on the Twin Towers when the first plane hits stayed at their desk answering emails. Who, when a, when a plane has had a hard landing and it's on fire, automatically reach for the overhead bin to get their roll off versus just getting the fuck off the plane and jumping down the slide. Like these things happen. And unless you're trained, unless you're trained in martial arts, special operations, or some form of outdoor mountaineering and wilderness medicine, you probably don't have these skill sets. They're, they don't come in grade school and they sure as hell don't get them in college. So unless you have one of those backgrounds or any kind of first responder, any kind of medical system, but I would even say first responders more than most big medical system doctors and nurses and, and PTs. If you're not, if you haven't practiced this software, no you're missing it and know that you need to go back and manually install it so you will be making better decisions. And the final bit of that talk is just to say, hey folks, um, we might be in a spot where let's just say everybody got super smart, super sober, super cooperative today or tomorrow. Um, at, back to the pig and the python, there is a hangover of, of effects from a long backed up chain of causes and not everybody is going to make it through. In fact, our colleague Zach Stein at Harvard uh, phrased it really brutally and poignantly, but potentially accurately. And we're seeing this with Syria. We're seeing this with Honduras. We're seeing this with Venezuela. We're seeing this a lot of places. And if, you, if you know, anybody that's forgetting what our realities looked like six months ago or three months ago with fires in Australia, right? And migrant caravans and Syrian refugees, all those things are still happening. Our eye is just off that ball for the moment. So the realities are, is that, you know, in fact, we'll just see, uh, we'll, we'll see where we get to in the slides. I won't, I won't repeat myself. Um, so to go back to, if, if this is all suitably like gut churning, saddening, etc., cetera, um, here's a shot in the arm, right? Which is, what did we expect, right? And think about the once in 10 years, we lived those lives, we prevailed during that time, right? Once in a hundred years, right? Our grandparents, right? We lived through World War I, the depression and World War II, like, holy shit. And they were, many of them teenagers going off to war or being married and having a child, you know, that, that was then left for the, for, you know, a ma, a single mom to be working in the factories or dust bowling it or whatever. Like we've done this and humans all around the world are still doing it. If we're in the developed West, we just happen to live in literally a, the freakish bubble of history, which is Western Europe and the United States and Canada from 1945 to now. That is three generations, baby boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials, who were born and raised in a pocket of stability, normal, normalcy, and hyperconsumption, from which we believed that was our birthright and presumed that it was the steady state of civilization and nature. It's not. 
So that is really, really key to help us inoculate against endless thumb sucking, like boo hoo, feeling sorry for ourselves and choking on our grief. The idea, I mean, much better be like, fucking A, man, that was a hell of a run. <laughs> like gratitude for the freestyling, free time, freewheeling times we've had. Gratitude to be able to hop on a cheap flight to Thailand and sit on the beach or Tulum or to jet off skiing or to be texting our friends with thousand dollar smartphones in our pockets. Just gratitude. It's been a hell of a run. And if it gets to keep going, awesome. And if it doesn't, it was a hell of a run. And we absolutely got the winning lotto tickets of all humans born on this planet ever already. But nobody promised us a rose garden. So on that front, um, I, would, I would presume to say that we kind of know what's happening with this current virus. Um, that is a pig in the python. Uh, we already have countries coming out the other side of it. We're going to get through this, right? It will be as gnarly as it turns out to be. And we already understand infection rates between one and four, one and 5%. There's the highs, there's the lows. Everybody's reading all that stuff, right? And the question is not, um, is, that, is this going to e eclipse humanity? It's not. But, right, this is the question of falling off your surfboard and getting dinged on the bottom. Ouch. Ooh, that's a little reef rash. You know, I got a little scraped. I might be a little bloody. You know, it's like falling off a skateboard. Like that sucked, right? But I'm back in action. I can even go back out and keep surfing if I want to. Versus the further extreme, which is I get slammed on the reef. I get held down for a while. I really am almost running out of air. I pull up my leash to my surfboard to get a gasping air and I, and just in time to see the next wave behind it coming down on my head. And then the same thing happens, but I didn't get a full lung full of air that time. So it's even sketchier the second time. And I do it again. And I come back to the surface and now there's a third wave in that set because I made the mistake of catching the first one, right? There's a third wave in that set and now I'm in the, you know, legendary, terrifying three wave hold down. And that may be where we are. It's not the virus that will be the thing, but the geopolitical, the macroeconomic, and the climactic ecological are real things. So I'd encourage everybody to do everything we need to do to manage what's emergent and right in our face, but do not take your eye off the rest of this because that's actually the stuff. And if you, you know, like to continue the surfing metaphor, like if you are with a jet ski partner, right? They're watching you. They're like, okay, they're down in one. I am doing everything I can to get them in and get them out of the impact zone as fast as fucking possible. And that's what we actually need to be paying attention to. And that's what most systemic existential risk folks that we're in contact with. I mean, we barely talk about the virus. It's not that. We will get through that. It'll be as gnarly as it's going to be, but we will get through that. It's what is the cascading effect? And is this now the beginning of a meaningful step down from which we don't get back to normal or business as usual in a foreseeable way? Um, this is just Sally, right? <laughs> which is just another version of the nobody promised us a rose garden. But like when she's jokingly writing her Christmas list and she's like, but I just want what's coming to me. You know, I just want my fair share. She's like real estate, <laughs> you know, but that idea of like, that's kind of us. And so let's get out of, let's disabuse ourselves of that. We, you know, what we've got coming to us is anything other than just what is coming and let's be responsible with that. Okay. So that's the situational assessment. Um, you, I mean, and I deliberately haven't been going into everything you can read on your social feeds. It's duplicative and there's no point being one more amateur in that space. Um, what I'd like to share now, uh, frames, I mean, somebody just asked, Goha just asked, what is, the, what is the corona distracting us from that is really happening? Well, I'll tell you, for starters, you've got collapse of OPEC, you've got a proxy oil war between Russia and the Saudis that kicked off the stock market, stock market decline. The, the basically American shale oil doesn't work below $50 a barrel, more or less. Russian oil reserves don't work below $30 a barrel, more or less. The Saudis can tank this all the way down to $10 a barrel. It'll fuck them long term, but they can actually make a play. And uh, there was an assassination attempt on an African prime minister yesterday. And oh, by the way, nobody really noticed, but Putin just extended his indefinite reign of Russia until like 2036. So you, what you're seeing is you're starting to see a number of um, what used to be geopolitical detente, like nobody willing to throw the cataclysmic move in case, case there was backlash, you know, or they got shut down, et cetera. There's a lot of spaciousness now 
And if people in their real politic calculations are, are determining that there's a keyhole event coming, meaning like not everyone's going to make it through. So get you and yours through the keyhole first, shut the door, and then you win. This is just like evolutionary biology 101, right? Who makes it across the land bridge, gets an entire island to populate, right? We, we may see a breakdown of geopolitical decision making. And that can lead to a whole host of other things because poverty and war are never eco groovy, which then becomes another compounding feedback loop. Okay, so um, to introduce, to go back to some familiar stuff, the flow cycle, if anybody's not feeling, I mean, some of you may be super on lock this week, right? Some of the guys we've been talking with is like, I haven't felt this alive in a while. Um, I feel completely on point in my power band awake, aware, engaged. So they're in their flow channel because they've basically been festering through day-to-day -day life because it's not challenging enough. For a number of folks, this week just dragged us into a place where the challenge, like how do we deal with a global pandemic? And what am I, what do I do with my kids in the daytime? And what's happened to my you know, portfolio? The challenge has just gone rocketing through the roof. And so now we're getting pulled into anxiety. And so the question is, is how do we manage this stuff such that to the extent that we possibly can stay as much in a zone of optimum performance as possible, right? So here is a model. Uh, again, those of you that are tight in our community have already seen this. Typically, we introduce this in relationship to uh, non-ordinary states, psychedelic states, how to make sense of the nonsensical or post-conventional. Um, but it also works swimmingly well in all these situations where you're basically dealing with complex, wicked problems. So the first is just to say, hey, um, Pascal's wager, Blaise Pascal, French mathematician, basically said, better for me to, to believe in God in case he's up there when I die than to not believe in God and to be doomed to eternal damnation and I was wrong. So it's a very much a hedge your bets kind of thing. So Pascal's wager basically says, consider the inconceivable just in case it matters and comes back to bite you. The next one, Occam's razor, people are familiar with this one. Simplest solution is usually the best. Don't overbuild complex things. This would go for conspiracy theories. This would go for magical inflation and psychedelic dreaming. This would go for a bunch of new age spirituality, but it also goes for, you know, um, complex existential risk stuff. And then Bayesian probability is just economic weighting, which is like when you're dealing with something really complicated and pretty much all the things we care about these days are, you're never gonna know right then what the answer is. But what you can do is identify all the variables that are in the equation, update them as rapidly as you can and continue to shift and change your probabilities. So we were just doing that with our son. Like, should he go on his spring break and go kite surfing in Hatteras? Or should he come home? And I'm like, well, dude, beginning of the week, it was 90-10. We're like, go fucking have fun. Knock yourself out. Then you come home. Now we're at 60-40. And in the last two hours, we're at 50-50 and probably actually switching to like throwing the bat signal, right? That's Bayesian probability in real time, right? So the idea is better to consider it. Don't get out over our skis with needlessly complicated answers to what could just be a functional solution. And an example of that might be is, was the, coronavirus weaponized and cooked up, a lab, up in a lab in Wuhan, right? You can burn a lot of fucking cycles on that. And you're like, mm, well, even if it was, it sounded like it was an accident that it got out. And even if it was and it did, so what? It's here now, right? And China got hit on the chin with it. So it's not exactly like they skated out anyway. So like, is it worth burning a whole lot of cycles on something like that that doesn't actually affect my choice making in the moment? Another different example would be like, are we all living in a simulation? You're like, oh, well, well, Elon Musk tweeted it and Nick Bostrom thought of it. And then you go back to it and you're like, mm, well, I mean, it really wouldn't matter at all. It would just mean that our sky god in a robe and sandals has been replaced with the architect from the matrix. But like, we're still here and it wouldn't change anything in any of our relationships unless somebody got into the cheat codes to the back door, like up, up, down, down, A, B, B, A, right? Woohoo! Now we can fly. Unless someone can figure that out, it doesn't really matter. So this is a very helpful tool, which we are deploying in real time right now. So now we're going to get to personal self. So that's, a, that's the end of like, I think, the end of high concept stuff. And we're going to get into like, how are you guys as leaders doing? Right? And how can we just tools to, to make sure of? Okay. 
So the first thing is um, I was racing mountain bikes when I was younger, um, was on the East Coast, lots of hilly up, downs, up, downs. You basically would hammer on the ups and then you'd coast on the way down and catch your breath. Moved to Boulder, started racing in the Rockies and realized very rough, abruptly, oh fuck, this is like a three hour uphill. There are no downs. And what I realized then is I was like, oh, instead of waiting for the obvious downhill to coast and catch my breath, I actually have to learn to recover on the slightly less steep parts, which sounds really banal and obvious, but try it. <laughs> Let's work on the assumption we are now on a multi-day, multi-week, multi-month, maybe even multi-year climb. And that our natural places of coasting downhill to catch our breath, whether that's paid time off, summer vacations, weekends, whatever, may not be there in quite the same way. The gradient might have just cranked up a bit. And so what we actually have to do is instead of straining and struggling, no matter what, because there's still the hill in front of us, realizing actually micro adjustments is where I catch my breath, where I drop my heart rate, and where I get back into a zone of recovery. Because here's the thing. And we were just, I was just having on a call with a physician who's in the, you know, on the front lines right now. And my biggest advice to her was engage active recovery. Active recovery is never letting you get, letting yourself get below half a tank so that I still have enough gas in my tank to make positive choices as to what I do to replenish. So that's, I'm going to go outside and go for a run. I'm going to call meaningful friends. I'm going to move my body. I'm going to eat, prepare and eat healthy food, right? That's active recovery. I'm going to sit in, in meditation practice. I'm going to do breath work, hot, cold sauna, you name it, but I'm going to do it versus I go until I break and then I'm on the couch, sick or comatose, Netflixing, eating fatty, salty, sweet things because I'm just so out of whack and it takes me three to five times as long to get back to a natural reboot than if I was engaging in active recovery. Okay, so this is really, really important, folks. It's really, really easy to shortchange ourselves. And this one is, is enormous. And just know it's, our batteries don't perform the same way when you do deep discharges. That actually takes a lot of life out of them. And what we really wanna do is the, the close, like set your red alert to 50%, not zero. And once you're anywhere near 50, Make sure you're going to take time out because this is marathon, not a sprint. And this is just the simplest model. You guys have seen this and we won't burn cycles on this, but basically, and we wrote about it in our newsletter this week, secure your peak experiences, engage in defragging our nervous systems, healing, mending, and integrating, and connect with the people you love and lead. And that is the cycle. And, and you don't just get to do the connecting <laughs> and, and, the, and, you know, and the working right? We do have to check out and check in and we do have to digest our grief and defrag our nervous systems. So please see this. This is the flywheel that keeps us going through all of this. Um, this one is just to basically say most people are way up their ladder right now. This comes from Chris Audris at Harvard Business School. If you want to go back and check out the deep cut on what this ladder of inference means, but it basically says in a nutshell, that at the bottom is reality, just as it's happening unfiltered. And the further up the ladder we get, we start picking little bits and pieces of it. We start assembling it into a puzzle. We then tell ourselves a story about the picture we see that then informs what decisions we make and what decisions we make affects what more of we see and we end up in this spun out loop up here. So this is the people who have been you know, in reading disaster porn and going to Whole Foods and cleaning out the toilet paper. And then they're more panicked because they went there to clean out the toilet paper, but the toilet paper was already cleaned out. So then they go back to their news feeds and are simply extending pictures, et cetera. Like that's the loop. For you guys as leaders, the, the, the recommendation is to get down this ladder and get as close to raw reality as possible with good sense-making tools, so good filters, right? And that's the umwelt. The umwelt is not all the bits and bytes of infinite reality. It's what can my senses perceive, right? And so we've talked about this before, but like bats and sharks and snakes and bees all have different umwelts. There's more reality out there than humans actually decode in real time. And then from what we can decode, we limit massively just so we don't go crazy and we can pay attention to stuff. So what we're saying here is from raw reality, which is very churny, 
and less predictable than it has been in some time, expand our envelopes, pay attention to more good signal, filter it, right? That's sort of the, the umwelt to the sense making, filter it with better models that are provisional and that are flexible while still being directionally accurate. So don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. What we need right now is just talking to a SEAL Team 6 commander yesterday. He said, yeah, Matt, he said, our fucking analysts, we always disappointed them. We always did something that was less perfect than what they cooked up, but it worked. So they would, and the analysts never went downrange. The analysts were always the eggheady guys in the corner thinking up the perfect answer. And then the commander would be like, give it to us. And then we're going to boil that shit down to what we're going to have to do or are able to do, and it will work. And the final bit here is the notion of interoception. I think, is there one more? Yeah, interoception, which is what is happening in our nervous systems? And can we as leaders be metronomes for others? And in fact, same, I mean, this is not a SEAL story, but I mean, the, same, the same commander was telling me, that he's like, I, he is, I never fired a shot in combat in all of his years in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and, and Africa. He's like, but, I, and, and, but when my guys would see me walking calmly through these free fire zones, they would all drop and they would all become grounded. And then we would be back, instead of being back on our heels, then we would be forward into solving the solution together. Then we would gel again. So that idea of our self-care, our management, our vagal nerve, our embodiment, our tone of voice, right? Our posture, these things matter. And so self-care as a leader has a cascading ripple effect at the level of interoception. We're scared little fucking tribal monkeys. This is like 2001 in the beginning where they hear those saber-toothed tiger going, rah, rah, and then they're like, rah, 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 and all they do is squeak and squawk in their cave, cowering at night, right? Be the fucking silverback, right? Be the one that people cue off. It's the Rudyard Kipling, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs. Right, be that. All right. And this is what it ends up being, right? Which is what we just described. If you can care for yourself and have yourself on lock with enough sustainable gas in your tank, then you've got juice for family and then you've got juice for community or organization. And then hopefully even the country and the world. This is a sliding scale. It is fungible, meaning subject to change over time with positive or negative environmental conditions. So look after yourself and think about where is your bubble and how far out can you extend it sustainably, okay? Because this is the jam. We've used this model in a lot of different ways, but basically the goal for enlightenment or attainment, and right now let's just say sustainable transformative leadership, so we can even boil it down to something really practical, is travel, can I take hits, right? But in order for me to take more than one hit, I have to have rebound, the ability to come back to zero, come back to center. And I also have the ability, I have to have the ability for dampening, which means I wanna take the energy of the hit and return it in a way that maintains my control, right? Versus me just pogo sticking. So for instance, I want, I want travel, I take a hit in the world right now. But if it goes springing back with the same force that I got hit, I'm gonna hurt somebody near me or get bucked off it myself. So travel, rebound and dampening, the ability to take hits, return and dissipate the energy in a controlled way, right? That keeps the rubber on the road. That equals steering and control. You guys have seen this one, that's just a prettier picture. It's a pretty, it's a beautiful picture. And I think it's important, right? Which is part of the ecstasis. Like, do we allow, even in the midst of the mayhem, right? The ability for all, the ability for gratitude, the ability in space for grace. Okay, so now we're gonna move a little bit in. If anybody is interested, I think there was something in this, these slides are maybe slightly out of order. So forgive me for uh, a little bit of uh, hopping around. But the idea here is that there is a movement already called Hope, Hope Punk, which is I think an awesome name, but it's basically saying, let's not go down with a whimper. Let's go with a bang and let's actually highlight and celebrate awesome shit that people are doing right now, already, for a while, 
that gives us hope and gives us signals and gives us examples of how we can do this better together. These are books that I highly, highly recommend you ordering yesterday. If you want to get specifically down and dirty, I would read Deep Survival and I would read Emergency. Those are the most like personal. And then I would read The Knowledge and Falter. And then The Deep Cut is Upheaval by Jared Diamond, The Guns, Germs and Steel author. But these are solid, solid books to begin wrapping your head around a spectrum of considerations, both global systemic and literally down to nitty gritty personal uh, with Deep Survival and Emergency. Okay, and we'll post the links to this so you don't need to scribble them. Okay, more good stories. If you haven't read the Pulitzer Prize winning book uh, from last year, The Overstory, it's a beautiful story of trees and sustainability and regeneration and human spirit. Uh, if you want something to watch uh, this weekend with your family, The Biggest Little Farm is an amazing story of a, of a couple unplugging from the grid and transforming space. And Gabby Otis boosted my hope in humanity more than almost any other little book possible, which is a completely off-grid, sustainable eco-village in Colombia um, that basically transformed a rural region and brought back the rainforest and employed indigenous folks and did all kinds of badass ecological, sustainable, off-grid living solutions, et cetera. And it's legendary uh, in the global community. And they're low-tech and they're high inclusion. So if you want stories of people doing this, these are the good stories, or at least some of them. Okay. Now, for the balance of our time, brass tacks. Um, I, I have no idea where you guys are uh, in your awareness or preparedness or even interest in these things. Um, but I would put, I would have put in the, this, the next slide, which is a quote from Sun Tzu, which he basically said, it is better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war, right? So that, you know, wrap your heads around it. Um, this would be the thing that we would recommend. And as I said, the, the balance, between timely and timeless, right? Something that actually doesn't have a shelf life and we're not all kind of like, oh, we have our sort of apocalypse hangovers and we're sort of embarrassed to admit what we were thinking about or doing or buying six months ago because whew, that's over, ha, 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 right? Not that. Let's actually get into what is the 80-20 of preparedness. And very specifically, the question is, um, what 20% can I do that will address 80% of contingencies. And that basically means uh, on the road to homegrown humans, this is shit we should have been doing anyway. So you're just, if you haven't done it already, you're late to the party, which is actually a relief because you're like, all these things are good. They're good because they make us self-sufficient as individuals, families, and communities. They're good because it's fun to pay attention to know where my power comes from, my water comes from, my food comes from you know, patching ourselves up when we get owies instead of rushing off to an ER or whatever, like all that stuff. Very straightforwardly good for humans. And if you want to get one step further, um, if you can get a refund on it, particularly if you're ordering shit from places like Costco or anywhere else that has easy, no hassle refund policies, if you can repurpose whatever you're considering buying right now, because the, the heat's on, uh, if you can repurpose it, like, well, we were going to go on a sailing trip or we were going to do a family camping trip, or I was planning on maybe this was the year I was going to Burning Man, or I was kind of interested in getting into a little bit more, whatever, lighten your footprint, sustainable off grid, whatever, anyway, rad, you know, and then worst case, and this would go for food supplies or anything like a lot, medical stuff, anything like that, or donatable. If, you, in fact, the storm passes and you're awesome and everybody's set. And the worst case scenario is you style out a nursing home, a soup kitchen, a homeless shelter, a poor family. Then do it and do it now without any of the bias of, well, who would I be if I did those things? If I took those steps, does that make me one of those whack nut preppers like those folks I saw in National, National Geographic? No, it doesn't. It makes yourself a homegrown human taking responsibility for yourself and your family so that you can be of service and leadership out there. This is something to think about. And I literally, we just had a coaching leadership uh, retreat uh, <laughs> three weeks ago and I didn't show this slide. And I didn't show this slide because it felt a bridge too far from most folks three weeks ago. Uh, at this point, it is not a bridge too far. One other intersecting set of trend lines you need to pay attention to is when does shit go black market pricing? Because everybody, all of a sudden, everybody all at once twigs onto the very same thing, which is this could save my ass or my life. 
And then suddenly you're not dealing with beautifully integrated global supply chains and, and you know, prime shipping on Amazon and one click buys of, you know, let's say $5 paper, you know, um, face masks. You know, now you've got price gouging or you've got out of stock indefinitely, or you've got all these things and suddenly you're in a very different economic situation, which is more true of developing nations, third world countries, aid camps, et cetera. And you're like, oh, shit, you couldn't buy this for all the tea in China if you wanted it because there just aren't any or they're, they're extreme and inflated prices. Uh, and the other is how much liquidity do you have? Very straightforwardly. Um, how much, how in cash are you? And then there's even another layer to this, which is, and that at some point you also start running the calculations and what are the likelihoods of the collection agencies, AKA the credit cards and the banks um, being solvent in 30 to 40 years. And shouldn't I just max all available possible credit I can get my mitts on right now to deploy to tools that make other tools or tools that save my ass or are sustainable. And I'll deal with the, you know, the potential of that on the other side. Case in point, Monday, interest rates were at historic lows, 2.9%, unfucking heard of, barely enough to cover the cost of doing business. By the end of the week, and weirdly, against all normal market metrics, they suddenly have jacked back up to 4%. And, and, our, and we were trying to refinance on Monday for exactly this reason. And which was, again, 80-20. Like, does it make sense to do long-term regardless of what happens? Yes, it does. Does it also potentially provide short-term tactical um, air cover or oxygen or runway? Yes, it did. Therefore, we were going to act decisively. Couldn't. We were locked out of the process. And now it's at 4%. And the mortgage guy's like, I don't understand what's happening or why. And it's like, well, I'll tell you what's happening, buddy. All the big banks got together behind the scenes. They're like, holy fuck. If everybody makes a run on the banks, refinances and drops their percentages by one and a half whole points, which is gajillions of dollars, we'll all go bankrupt. So we're cranking up the drawbridge on availability of debt and credit right now. So if you can expand your credit card limits, call them up and ask. It's probably getting a little late. We're starting to see the uptick on that bottom curve. But anything you can do now that avoids this, this intersection, you being on the wrong side of this intersection, is helpful and act decisively. Uh, this is... Uh, Ralph Fiennes, uh, pretty much arguably the world's most famous mountaineer and explorer. He's, he climbed Everest at 65. He's the only one to have climbed Everest and, and gone to both poles. Um, I said, there's no way that's true, but it was, at least he was the first to do it. But he said this, and we used to use this in our backcountry courses with, you know, <laughs> with students all the time, right? There is no such thing as bad weather. There's only bad clothing, right? And that goes for much more than clothing. So wrap our heads around churning uncertain times. And then this is how I'd start prioritizing what you do. So basically this is a classic two by two. Um, you've got low value to high value left to right. You've got low cost to high cost bottom to top. Okay. If something is basically low cost, high value, this is that 80, 20 that'll save your ass. Do it now. Our animations never seem to work in order. If something is high value, high cost, start planning it now. For us, this was adding three Tesla power walls and solar system that can actually manage air conditioning and charge a Tesla in Austin if we end up booting down here and not fucking off to someplace nicer. If it is high cost, low value, at least in the sense of harvestable real world value for now, pay attention to it, research it. For us, that was, do we look into drilling a well so that we're not beholden to city utilities in case something goofy happened, right? And then if it's high cost, or if it's low, let's say low, low cost, low value, don't do it for now. And that doesn't mean absolute values, that means can we make use of it now? So there could be a thousand choices that we consider. Should we do this? Should we, shouldn't we do that? Right now, all you want to focus on is your 80-20, which is high return, low cost or effort, right? Bigger, bolder plays, start planning, start researching, and then, and then have your kind of bull, bullpen or hopper of stuff that we're not acting on it at all right now. So in the shit or go blind moment, have a bucket where we're capturing the thought, but right now it's not the next thing for us to do. So we're going to ignore it 
but we've got it documented. And so this is now the brass tax, which is the things we would recommend. First of all, if you haven't already, um, stock up and plan on eight to 12 weeks, depending on where you are in the world. If you can avoid standing in lines and those kind of things, we started even as recently as two days ago, we were still ordering 50 pounds sacks of shit um, to be delivered at our doorstep from Amazon. If they can bring it to your door versus you standing in lines, awesome. Anything regarding um, in addition to food and dry goods uh, for indefinite quarantines and loss of mobility, et cetera, um, anything you can do for food security, Meaning like if you have a little square foot garden in your backyard, they're super fun and easy. If you have kids, you can make it really fun and engaging. There are little vertical gardens that you can order at Ikea and other places that help you grow stuff with like natural water and little bits of soil, sprouting trays for chia, wheatgrass, sprouts, et cetera. If you just have greenery, um, those are awesome. And worst case scenario, again, back to the 80 20 of it. Worst case scenario is you have fresh herbs and fresh greens for your life, which are awesome you know, and maybe you're doing a little bit of a dry run of, huh, what would happen if we had the little house on the prairie this for a little bit? If you've got a function, if you've got a doctor, a friendly doctor, get some prescriptions now. There's a massive run on medications, but go to the extent that your skill set and comfort and training allows. Um, we have been having everybody in our community take wilderness first aid courses for the last year plus, as well as engaging community service. It was less for the actual medical skills, although they're super valuable, but more for situational awareness and general leadership. Um, now we're in a place where we've kind of run out of option values, but if you have the ability to jump into one of those, I would actually up it and say, take a wilderness first responder. They're a nine day course. If in, for any reason, public utilities go down, which happened for PG&E in San Francisco, which have happened various brownouts, blackouts, et cetera, around the world. If you live in South Africa, if you live in any other country, you know this already, but you want to have a way to have drinkable water. And basically this list backed up from me leading up, you know, expeditions. If we have water, if we have food, if we have fuel, if we have the ability to sleep warm and dry, if we have med kit, if we have maps and a compass, and if we have whatever technical gear we need, we're, we can hang out there indefinitely. And not only can we manage floods, storms, blizzards, <laughs> crazy shit comfortably, right? Because we have skills and resourcefulness and good decision-making. We can even choose to do harder things on purpose for fun in that environment. But you miss any of those basics. You know, what the Boy Scouts would call the five essentials or stuff like that. If you're missing any of those, you're in a degraded situation and you're having to beat your retreat back to the trailhead, back to the cars, back to a general store. So have your, the equivalent of your five or your 10 essentials, right? Water filtration is key. It's not emergency necessary right now. So all the more reason to go get some some form of communication that is more reliable than your phone in case cell, cell towers or Wi-Fi goes down. Some form of rechargeable batteries. Um, we would recommend, uh, this is the f only thing I'm recommending by brand, but Goal Zero does military spec, expedition grade, flexible solar panels, and you can buy a 100 watt one that you can plug in an iPad, plug in your phone, and you can stay connected, even if the lights went out. And so that's super important. Another caveat there, uh, is to basically just let folks know if it's painted green, olive green or camo, um, it's probably a piece of shit made in China that doesn't work. Um, unless you are truly in a you know, military supply <laughs> surplus place and you can hold it and you can actually affirm and confirm that it is true military spec stuff. Um, don't get suckered into survivalist prepper sites. They are almost always flogging shit. Um, do go with known and established outdoor brands that are battle hardened. And I, and I mean, just like they've been gear tested because even, even in the field, right. Even actually using outdoor gear, you could tell the difference between brands and who did field testing and who didn't because you'd put, you put the thing to use the way it was supposed to be used or looked like it could be used. And then some shit would just fall apart. It didn't have good bar attacking. It wasn't stitched. The zippers blow out, the filters clog, you name it. You know, and then the good stuff was infinitely repairable, durable, and bomber. So when we talked about those, um, the filters, that's an example. Um, and I think, was that it? Jerry cans and bug out bags. I wouldn't normally put this one, but I put it on, uh, which is extra gas cans for range in your vehicle. If situations change and you suddenly decide you don't want to be where you are and you do need to be someplace else. And some form of bug out bags, which is just the basics for everybody in your family. 
And this one is again, goofy as fuck, but um, as civilization degrades, it's a thin veneer. Uh, one of our advisors said, you're only ever five missed meals from total anarchy. And we are gonna get to test that a little. Um, so the idea is don't go running for guns, at least we're not gonna advocate that. Um, if you are already a, a, you know, a firearm, trained firearm owner, um, continue your training. The odds of it going sideways on you are far higher than it saving your ass. And even one of the spec ops firearms uh, guides that we've you know, followed and paid attention to doesn't carry a weapon himself. He carries a pepper gel gun. And potentially, because what you don't want to do, you're not going to beat a crazy full frontal assault of anything ever, <laughs> you know, unless you've really gone off the reservation. Um, and, but what you don't want to do is be hijacked by a desperate tweaker with a 22 pistol. At least I wouldn't want to be, and I wouldn't want that on behalf of my family. So having non-lethal, incapacitating, helpful things with you, pepper gel, mace, handheld tasers, does that guarantee a fucking thing? No, it doesn't. But it at least leaves you not totally vulnerable to someone who's chosen to break the societal contract ahead of you. So those are the things. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, and just, yeah, cash, because who knows? And I'm not going to make any provisions on Bitcoin or gold or, you know, that kind of goofiness. Um, we'll just say that, hey, who knows? At a minimum, ATMs could be low on bills when you need them <laughs> or power could be down or whatever. Um, so that's it. Uh, and then that just leads us into the story, which I'll just leave us with, which is this is also part of a bigger thing. And us having stories to live and guide by matter. They really do. They are, they are what guide us. I mean, this is Winston Churchill. This is MLK. This is Lincoln, right? It's the narratives that we remember because it's the narratives that let us hum. And so this is the thing, right? If we have the ability to do that ecstasis, catharsis, communitas, with integrity, with joy, with courage, with competency, and with calm, right? We don't end up waiting for someone to bail us out, waiting for someone to save us, right? We step up together. We do what we have to do. And the sooner we do that, and the more bravely and courageously we do that, the more fun we can have with it. Because as Alice Walker has also said, not only are we the ones, no fucking surprise there, right? But she also said, right, hard times call for furious dancing. So let's not forget that part. Let's not forget loving the ones we're with. Let's not forget being grateful for the lives we've lived so far. And let's take the capable, competent action that is within us to do and leave the rest to jaw. So that's it, folks. I uh, hope it's all, hope that's helpful. Um, if anybody has any more questions, uh, feel free to follow up in the comments. We'll probably monitor that, post some links, uh, do that kind of stuff. And in the meanwhile, um, thank you for being good humans. This is the play. This is the project, right? Anthropos, awake and aware. We've already shot the moon. We already realized nobody gets out of here alive. And we're showing back up to honor and celebrate the gift and the mystery and the responsibility of being born in these bodies in this lifetime on this planet. All of us are none of us. So that's it. Have fun. Be well. Stay safe and lots and lots of love.